science fiction writers have produced some very, very strange and scary creatures in the line of books and films. And a lot of people are drawn to that. They love to be scared by these monsters and creatures. But what have I told you today? That there were creatures in the Bible that are so scary that when they spoke, houses shook and doorposts moved. What if I were to tell you today that just by them flying and the flapping of their wings, it was like thunder? Well, there's some stranger things in the Bible, and I call these the throne dwellers. Well, good morning. Welcome to uh, Crosswalk Church. I'm Pastor Armand Agnew. I am by myself, so uh, I'm hoping that somebody check and see if we are and made it live. We are using, thank you, I got a thumbs up. Uh, all my team is out today. Uh, we want to uh, just reach out to all those church folks today that are traveling and out and about. Be careful out there. Uh, we miss you. We want to welcome everybody watching today live by Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch, or maybe you're watching it later on on Rumble or one of our websites. Welcome this morning. This is Stranger Things in the Bible. Now, this is probably the most technically difficult uh, episode I've ever done, and I'm by myself. So I have verses. I have a ton of graphics I want to go. So I'm going to be looking off the side to the modern stuff. Just uh, forget about all that. But I told you the Bible has some very, very strange strange creatures where just their very voice will shake a house it will make people fall to the ground like dead men well what do these creatures look like well here they are yes a cherub boy does that look scary or what huh what do y'all think yeah that's a cherub we're gonna be talking about cherubs today perhaps you own this picture Somewhere in your house, you've got that hanging up. Uh, oh, you know what? I didn't start this. Ah, okay. I'm halfway into it. Now I got my, re I always do a backup recording. Uh, anyway, how many of y'all have this in your house? Talking to my church here today. How many of y'all know somebody? Pillows and pictures. And yeah, everybody's got these uh, in their house. And this one is from the movie Night Museum. And the little angels, they were really cute. They were, you know, uh, flying all over and floating around and around. And uh, so they were cute. But listen, uh, this is not what a cherub looks like at all. We're going to look at something today. Let me tell you where this came from. A man named Donatella, uh, back around the 1380s, early uh, 1400s, he was a sculptor from uh, Florence, Italy. And he began to do these sculptures of children with wings. And so this is uh, Donatello there. That's his first one. It's called Addis. And uh, that's what it looks like. And you can see the face, the little chubby cherub looking face. And uh, so that's what they, but look, these creatures look nothing like this. And as uh, scary as some of the science fiction movie creatures, there were some creatures in the Bible that were seen by Daniel and Ezekiel and John the Revelator and Isaiah that are scary. And we're going to talk about these today. In fact, this is our title today is Throne Dwellers. We're going to be looking at, listen, we, we have no clue what heaven looks like today. Most people in their mind have this thought of the clouds with the gate with St. Peter, you know, and God walking around, you know, welcome everybody in. But when you really get down to what the Bible talks about, what heaven's going to look like. Now, we're going to spend three weeks on this creature feature, and we're going to talk about heaven. We're going to talk about the things of heaven and uh, what the throne room looks like. Today, we're going to get a glimpse of it through Ezekiel's eyes. We're going to be reading Ezekiel 1, 4 through 28. So if you have your Bible, you can get that out. I'm going to be throwing these up, trying to throw these up on the screen as we go here. A lot of verses, but I want you to understand what a cherub is, and we're going to be looking at that. <clears throat> so here's our part one. Uh, cherubim. What exactly is a cherubim, and what do they do? What is their job? What is their purpose? Boy, this is going to be so good. It's going to be so amazing. Are you ready for it? Crosswalk, you guys ready? Good. Here we go. We're going to really get into the Bible today. These are high-ranking angels connected with God's, now look at this, retribution, uh, retribution and redemptive 
purposes concerning mankind. Hmm. You know, a lot of people think that God is love and he accepts everybody the way they are. Listen, uh, we got to get our minds corrected on what our biblical view of what God and heaven and these beings and all the things about God. God is so powerful and so awesome. We can't even imagine or begin to imagine how fearful this is. And uh, not a fearful that, you know, God wants us to hide from him, but we need to be uh, have a reverential awe of God. Somebody say amen. Man, when we're in God's presence, we need to understand how powerful and how magnificent God is. So Ezekiel, he has a, a vision <clears throat> by the river Chebar. He's in captivity, and he sees something. And the first thing he sees is uh, that storm. I'm going to back up one slide here. This is the storm that he sees in this vision, and it's a giant tornado. It has fire and lightning, and its fire is enveloping within itself, and there's this tremendous loud sound. And I really think you need to understand that Ezekiel was very shook by this vision. How many of you would be too? Come on, amen. This would really shake us up. So I'm going to start uh, here with verses. Let me start with verse uh, four and five, and I'm in the way, so I'm going to have to just kind of lean over. Here we go. And I looked, and behold, a, uh, a whirlwind came out of the north in a great cloud, a fire enfolding itself, and the brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, of the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, something's going to come out of this tornado that we've been seeing here, the picture I just showed you. Out of the storm is going to come something like the likeness of men. So now remember, he's seeing something there are no words for. He doesn't understand all this thing. Nobody's really been to heaven to know these. So he's trying to put, it's like John the Revelator, and we're going to look at him uh, probably next week. But they see things, and Daniel, they see things that they don't understand because they're seeing the future. Come on, they're seeing things that haven't even happened yet. So they're seeing things that are trying to put it into a vernacular that they can understand. John sees this tornado. It is horrific. It is huge. It is covering the whole uh, earth. And out of it is this fire and this flame and all this lightning. Then he begins to see some creatures coming out of that. Let me go on with what he said. Verse 5, And also I looked out of the midst there came the likeness of four living creatures. Everybody say four. And there were their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Maybe I, oh yeah, I think I can jump over to that one. Here we go here in a second. So they had the likeness of a man. Uh, let me just sh jump over to this one. And this is kind of what he saw. All right. He sees four men-like creatures. And uh, these four men-like creatures are coming out. They have the Visually, they look like men. But then he goes on into uh, the next verse, verse 6, and he says this, And everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. Everybody say four. So we need to understand what he's seeing here is that there are four creatures. Now, how many of y'all have ever seen a creature on this planet that had four? four faces on one head. That right there is kind of creepy. He's seeing something that is out of this world. They're not aliens, but they are alien to us. But there's something about them, and we're going to really dig, dig into this. But they had four faces. They had four wings. And it goes on, and it says here, once again, I'm having to jump around a little bit. Let's look at seven. It says, and their feet were straight feet. And once again, they looked like a man. They had the face of, of a man, the body of a man. They had legs. But when you get to the feet, not only is the head different with four heads, it has wings. Uh, but I want you to understand that um, it, it uh, has something different with the feet. Now, look at the feet. And their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. Now, what in the world is going on with that? Well, let me just give you uh, another visual here. Now, this, is a, uh, this isn't very scary. Uh, it's a pencil drawing. But you can see it's got four heads. 
Uh, I'll get into those in a minute. It's got feet, legs like a man, feet like a cow. It's a calf, like their hooves. And it's got two sets of wings. All of these things mean something. Nothing in the Bible uh, goes without meaning something. So we're going to jump over to a, another verse. Let me see if I can keep up with myself here. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they had uh, and they four had faces and their wings. So he's seeing these things. Uh, these creatures are angels, basically, but we'll get into that. Remember, not all angels have wings. These have wings, and we're going to talk about seraphim later on. They also have wings, but he's got man's hands under these wings. Now, let me just read verse 9, and it, it goes on. It talks about uh, the wings were joined one to another. It's talking about there's four of them, their, their wings touched, their upper wings touched, and they turned not when they went. They went everyone straight forward. So what is happening here is they are actually moving in a direction that is straight. They don't turn. When they, when they move, it's straight or it can move the sideways, but that face always faced the same direction. That's kind of weird. And we'll talk about what those things mean here in a minute. So here's another uh, picture that somebody's done. You can see the four faces. Uh, you can see the arms coming out from uh, around the wings. You can see the calves. feet. This was not an everyday thing. This was something strange. Listen, this is not science fiction. This is real. This is in the Bible. This is what we call cherubim. They have a job. They are angels. They are very high-ranking angels. And we're going to get into uh, a, a little bit more detail about all these things. I have so much to give you today. I hope that you can uh, hang with me and, and understand what's going on. Now, let me give you verse 10 here so you can see it. Here we go, verse 10. Let me get myself out of the way. For the likeness of their faces, they had the face of a man, the face of a lion. And on the right side, they had, uh, let me back up. I really tore that one up. As for the likeness of their faces, they had four, they four had the faces of a man, the face of a lion on the right side. Uh, they had four, uh, all four of them had the face of an ox on the left side. And all four of them had the face of an eagle that was behind them. So <clears throat> we're seeing uh, these things. Let me go to 11 and 12 while I'm here. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upwards. Two wings of every one were joined to one to another, and two they covered their bodies. Uh, so the upper wings were stretched out, and they touched the wings of the angel next to them. So all four of them were across. I'll show you that in a second. And with two of them, they covered their bodies. Um, look at verse 12. I'm going to close this one. Verse 12. And they went, everyone, straight forward. Now look at this. <clears throat> Whither the Spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not when they went. So these things are being led by the Spirit. Let me give you a couple more verses here. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. <laughs> you got to understand, these things had fire uh, glowing in them. They were This fire was coursing through their bodies. Lightning was coming out from them. And uh, it, it's just one of those things you go, wow, you know, I can't believe this is something that we're going to see when we get to heaven. Come on. Heaven's going to be a whole lot different than what everybody thinks. But listen, these things moved as fast as lightning. Does anybody know how fast lightning goes? <clears throat> lightning goes 60,000 miles a second. But he didn't say they went as the speed of lightning. He said they were quick as lightning. To him, he had no idea what, how fast lightning went. But because of who they are and what they're doing, and I'll you know expound on that in a minute, they could go from one end to the uh, uh, universe to the other end of the universe in seconds, literally in seconds. There is no time and space limitations on these, and it's just really crazy. Now here, listen, they are the radiation of their brightness 
is they're expressing the glory of God, Jehovah God. Come on. The glory of God, it says the Spirit was in them. The Holy Spirit of God shone through them like lamps. The Holy Spirit of God moved on them, and they followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. If the Spirit told them to move this way or that way, they would move in those directions. So let me give you some symbolism today. Real quick here. <clears throat> How many of y'all having allergy stuff going on? Yeah. Hold on a second. All right, I'm going to jump through all these slides here and go to my symbolism. Here we go. Uh, the number four, biblically, is the number of directions. We have the four corners of the world. We have four directions, which are what? North, south, east, and west. So the number four has a lot to do with world and direction. So Ezekiel saw these coming with judgment in chapter 1, but to restore in chapter 10. What are you talking about? Well, let's kind of give a little back background before I go on, because it's going to deal with Jesus Christ. This is an amazing study. You need to understand that during Ezekiel's time, he was saying that Jerusalem was going to fall and all the nations around it were going to fall. Uh, the Babylonians were going to come down and they were going to destroy. So we see in this vision, Ezekiel sees God, uh, his throne coming in this storm and this, uh, these beasts, these creatures are there. And once again, in chapter 1, they're coming for judgment. Then in chapter 10, he doesn't call them cherubs in chapter 1, but in chapter 10, he calls them cherubs. And they come the second time to restore Israel. Now, let me give you this today because this is really good. This is all symbolic of Jesus Christ. The first time Jesus came, he came to take the judgment of God for our sin. He came to destroy the curse. Somebody say amen. So this is all reflecting of the gospel of Jesus, what he was going to do. He was going to come from the throne of God, and he was going to come, and he was going to take the judgment. The second time Jesus comes back, what's he going to do? All my scholars in the house. He's going to restore the kingdom of God. It's the same thing. In the first uh, chapter of Ezekiel, these uh, cherubims are bringing the throne of God to this planet. God's going to judge the nations. The second time he sees them in chapter 10, he's coming to restore Jerusalem to gather his people in Jerusalem. Somebody tell me that's been watching, where is Jesus going to set up his kingdom? Somebody say it. Jerusalem. You guys are awful quiet today. Jerusalem, he's going, to re he's going to restore a kingdom. He's going to come back, and guess what? He's going to put the uh, throne in Jerusalem. It's going to be amazing. So look, this is what it's all about. Look at John 3, 16. For God so loved the what? The world. world is four. It has to do with four. Everything you're seeing about these creatures is in fours. So we're seeing God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. God loved the world. Listen, we need to understand God's love because we uh, tend to give a definition of love based on us, based on the world, based on things around us. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but a lot of people think love is, you know, receiving something. If somebody gives you something, oh, they love you. But when somebody corrects you, well, they don't love you. How many of y'all know what's more beneficial? Somebody giving you something or somebody correcting you? Correcting you, yes. So we need to understand the biblical definition of love as it uh, is with God. God loves us, but sometimes God has to allow things to happen to us to get our attention. But God still loves us. Listen, God still loves you even though you're going through a trial today. Yeah, he loves you. He never stopped loving you. He's allowing that trial, <clears throat> excuse me, in your life so that he can purify you. We're talking about metals and burning and purification. Listen, God does everything he does for your benefit. Boy, somebody needs to get excited, start throwing shoes in the house, whatever. God so loved the world. This is all about the world. It's, this is what it's talking about. So let's talk about this for just a second. 
<laughs> it gets even better. So Ezekiel's having this really crazy vision, man. He's just, he's on the river Chibar. God, oh, this, now this is a vision. It's not a dream. It's like a picture show, you know, on a big screen right there with his eyes open and he knows what's going on. He's completely aware of what's going on. He sees this uh, vision of God. Now he goes on, he talks about what these faces are and here's how they connect to Jesus Christ. The four faces of Jesus. The man is the son of God, son of man. Jesus became man. The lion, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Strength and the conquer. Jesus was strong, but he was strong in his meekness. We think strength is somebody comes along and can conquer, you know, and kick down doors and, you know, just whatever. But Jesus didn't do that. But he had more strength and more uh, ability to conquer things through his meekness. And that is something we need to learn. We're going to talk about that a little bit here later on in our next service. The ox, oxen was a servant and what? A sacrifice. They sacrificed bulls and oxen. Uh, he was the sacrifice. He died on the cross for us. So listen, this thing is crazy. Ezekiel was seeing the gospel. He was seeing something that he could not explain. He was seeing creatures that basically are going to make him fall to his face. It's going to freak him out, man. And it would do us too. How many of y'all know if you were sitting around your house and an angel showed up, you would just die right there? You would, man. You wouldn't be able to handle it. It would just scare you to death. Uh, also, these uh, have been known, if you see the picture down below me, uh, and Bill and Sandra have been to I Israel. A lot of the churches in Israel have these domes uh, uh, with paintings in the middle of the church, and they have the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, back sometime, whenever, uh, they tried to ascribe these four uh, features of these uh, cherubim to the gospel writers, but nobody's ever been on the same page. It's just really difficult. But anyway, there they are, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can see uh, how they, they try to attribute that, and that's all over church. That's a man thing, not necessarily a God thing. So when Jesus is described in his returning, he's described as coming with burning feet. What did these cherubs have? Feet that did what? They burned. They were like burning brass. Let me give you this verse here. Amazing verse. Look at Revelation 10.1. And I saw another mighty angel come down. It's talking about Jesus from heaven. He was clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head. We're going to get into that in a little bit. And his face as it was uh, were the sun and his feet as pillars of. Come on. This is all <laughs> reflecting what Jesus is going to be like. Listen. When he returns in his glorified body, it, it, it's going to be like glowing. He's going to have this fire on him. And it's, it, listen, everything about God has to do with this consuming fire. Why? Because God is a, uh, a, a God of holiness. He does, and fire, what does it? It purifies. It burns off things that are impure. But there's more. Oh, I love this. How many of y'all getting something out of this day? This is so good. So the throne of God interacting with man. I think I jumped something here. I did. Let me back up. What did I do? I'm sorry. Hold on just a second. All right. Let me go on to the, uh, <laughs> I'm by myself. So uh, this is one of the things. Let me go find this verse here. Uh, verse 15. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, but look at this. Verse 15, and it says this, as for the, uh, oh, there's more to it. There are wheels within wheels. If you've ever read Ezekiel, you know that, that what he saw were wheels uh, within wheels. And uh, there, there was a guy back in the late 60s, early 70s. I can't remember. I can't pronounce his name, but he took this verse and he started trying to explain UFOs because UFOs look like wheels within wheels. They kind of float. They go wherever they want. So he was saying, you know, Ezekiel saw UFOs. Well, he did. They were unidentifiable flying objects to him. They weren't alien. Well, they were alien, <laughs> but not like we think. Here we go. Let me give you a, uh, man, I went way ahead. Let's see, 15. And their appearance of the wheels and their work was like the color of burl, and their four, which is kind of a green color. And therefore had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel 
was in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides and they turned not when they went. So uh, what they were doing was, let's see, this is where I want to go now. If it'll come up, there we go. Let me bring myself back in. So uh, this is talking about uh, the throne of God. I dropped a slide somewhere. But basically what they're saying is, maybe it's over here. Oh, I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, when I think of this, I think of a gyroscope. How many of y'all remember the gyroscopes? You pull the little thing and it spins, and it could, it could balance on a piece of string. It was a wheel within a wheel, and it was spinning. Everything we have today, technology-wise, that moves pretty much has a gyroscope in it. Jets, the Rockets that go to the moon, those little boards that everybody rides on, I don't know what they call them, those floating things, whatever they are, they all have gyroscopes in them. Why? Because gyroscopes keep you balanced and keep you up. And you know what? Uh, they haven't made anything yet. They haven't made anything that can move kind of in different erratic directions. But I was watching a video on these guys on these hoverboards, I guess they call them, where you stand on, it's got the wheel. It only goes straight, though. But when you think about it, it looked just like what you're talking about. It would just float. And one day they're going to make one that will kind of just float whatever without changing your direction. So here's what we need to understand. The vision that he saw was the throne of God. It was the throne of God coming down, interacting with man, because the wheels interacted. It says that the wheels were on the earth. Now look at Psalm 99.1. The Lord uh, reigneth, let the people tremble. In God's sight, the people need to tremble. He sitteth between the what? He sits between the cherubs, let the earth be moved. In other words, he said, God sits between the cherubs. He rules and reigns. He's bringing his judgment. The earth is going to be moved. What moved? When, when Ezekiel saw these cherubs, they began to speak and, the, and they began to flap those wings. The house that he was in uh, began to shake. We well, visualize this. He, they began to shake and the doorposts were moving. It was like the sound of thunder and lightning, like a giant storm. It was very, very dreadful. In fact, verse 18 talks about the uh, dreadfulness of the, there were eyes all over that. He can't, he doesn't know what he sees. He's trying to describe it the best way he can. So these wheels within the wheels had eyes and they represented the uh, omnipresence and omniscience of God. God is everywhere. We say, hey, God is everywhere. His presence is everywhere. His uh, knowledge is everywhere. God is everywhere. And this is what this was denoting. It was denoting those things. So everything is connected to, uh, eh, wrong side. Uh, everything is connected to the spirit in verses 19, 20. We'll get to that. It's kind of, these are the artist drawings. This is kind of what you see. Uh, there are the, uh, the, the, uh, the cherubs under the throne. Uh, we see the throne with God on it, the emerald throne, the rainbow. We're going to get into a lot of that teaching here in the next couple of weeks. Hopefully, I won't. This has been a this is a very technical, um, uh, graphic wise, and and I have no help today. So we're going to get on down. Let me look at verses nineteen, and uh, where are you? Eighteen. Here we go. Nineteen. Yeah, nineteen through twenty. I'm just going to read these down. Let me pull myself out. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. In other words, uh, Ezekiel seeing this vision of the throne of God, because God dwells among the cherubs. Whenever you see cherubs, it's going to represent the presence of God. So we know that this is what's going on here. Let me give you verse 20. Whether so the spirit was to go, they went. They're the, their spirit to go. And the wheels were lifted up against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So we know that the Holy Spirit was in these creatures. It was guiding these creatures. It was uh, telling them when to move and how to move. And it says, when those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. In other words, the wheels and the chair were all one. And they all went together. All four of them together. Kind of weird. And uh, when they were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. I'm going to go ahead and read this on down. Look at verse 22. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of terrible crystal stretched forth over their head. So he's seeing these creatures, and he's seeing a throne, and he's seeing 
a throne. I call it the throne sitter. I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to read, read this down and come back. And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Every one had two, which covered on this side, and every one had two, which covered on that side of their bodies. So they're flying with two, and they're covering themselves with two. And verse 24, And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. Wow. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood, and they let down their wings. In verse 26, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. These are throne dwellers. As the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man <clears throat> above it. Somebody was sitting on that throne. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire around about within it, from the appearance of his thrones, even his loins, even upwards, and from the appearance of his loins, even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire and had the brightness round about. And one last verse. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. We're going to look at that. And so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. So what we're seeing is John is seeing something pretty amazing. Uh, not John, Ezekiel. John's going to see it too. Ezekiel is seeing something very, very cool. Look at this. So he's seeing these cherubs. There's these wheels within wheels, and there's thunder, and there's lightning, and there's all these things going on. And then all of a sudden he sees above that a, a, a figure of a man on the throne. It didn't say he saw God. He said he saw the appearance was as of a man. So that was either a Christophany, a pre-incarnate Christ, or a theophany, because God is spirit. He has no body. In fact, the Bible talks about the appearance of God, and it says that, listen, we cannot even approach God. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.16 says, Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light, which no man can approach, which no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So what he's saying is, listen, nobody's going to really see God. We can't see God. He's a, a light that's unapproachable. So how does God manifest, manifest himself to us? Through Jesus Christ. Yes, my, oh, it's just through Jesus. So it's probably Jesus on the throne or, or a theophany of God that's on my throne. But look, I love this. It said, and I fell on my face. <clears throat> Can you imagine? You're seeing this. It's just deafening. You talk about a light show. You talk about something that they can't do with special effects. This is going to be amazing. Ezekiel is seeing this, and it, he says, I felt like a dead man. I just felt, listen, when we get in God's presence, we need to understand, and when we do, we will. When we get into the presence of God, we need to understand how crazy awesome it's going to be. It's going to, our, our, we're just not going to be able to stand in the presence of God. If you've ever been one of them good old Holy Ghost movement, movements of God, come on, somebody say amen. And man, the power of God falls in that service so strong in that altar that your, your knees give way. And you just fall down, and all you want to do is just fall in the presence of God and just worship Him and sing those praise songs. That's what God, because the Spirit of God is in the place. That's what's going on. That's what we need to understand. Now, let me give you some other places that cherubs were found. It's going to make sense. Real quick here, let me show you this. They were found in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve got met, uh, were expelled from the Garden of Eden, look at verse uh, 24 of Genesis 3. So he drove out, the man, drove out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims. Everybody say it. And they had flaming swords, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So he puts these cherubs there. They have four faces. They have these swords. They're blazing. And it says they could watch. Listen, when, you, when you're one directional, you know, somebody can do a, uh, you know, a distraction. You look over there and you can sneak in behind them. But how do you sneak in around somebody that's looking every direction? You can't do it. Some of your parents need this, right? We need the skill. Some of you have it. You ever had, you know, how'd you know I was doing? I have eyes behind the back of my head. <clears throat> well, these cherubs literally had eyes in the back of their head. Let me give you some more real quick. I need to get uh, down through these today. Uh, 
the tab, this is, you need to really grab this one. The tabernacle in the wilderness and Solomon's temple were inundated with pictures of cherubs, either carvings or the veil through the Holy of Holies had cherubim sewed, embroidered on that veil. Remember, this is the last thing that separates the priest from the Holy of Holies. Talk about that in just a moment. There was a cherub on it. You had to go past that to get into the Holy of Holies. Uh, Solomon's temple had all these carvings. I believe that the uh, uh, the third temple, the, the uh, tribulation temple that's coming, is going to have these things everywhere. Ezekiel 41, 20. And from the ground uh, unto above the door were cherubims and palm trees made. And on the wall of the temple, they're carved all over the place. They're everywhere because they represent the presence of God. Now, here's the one I want to focus on. You got to catch us one today. The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a piece of furniture in the tabernacle and in the temple that had very specific uh, dimensions and rules that God wanted made. It's basically a box with a lid. And on that lid, they carved two cherubs. And we'll look at that. It says that they had their faces bowed and they covered themselves with the cherub. Well, God met in the, in the Old Testament, in the, uh, in the wilderness. He would meet the priest once a year in the tabernacle. In Solomon's day, he would meet the priest in the Holy of Holies at the Ark of the Covenant because, listen, nobody can ever see God. So God put those cherubs there because wherever the cherubs are, that's where the presence of God is. Y'all remember that old song we used to sing, I Can Feel the Brush of Angels' Wings? Come on, y'all remember that? You know what they were singing about? They were singing about cherubs. Come on, when you begin to get into the realm of God and you begin to worship God, those cherubs may come in there. You can't see them, but that may be what you're feeling. So we may be in the presence of cherubs today, but we can't see them in the realm of them. But if we did, would that freak us out or what? But it's the presence of God. Wherever God's presence is, these things were located. Now look at this. They were on the lid. It's called the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Exodus 25, 22. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubs, which are upon the Ark of the Testimony, of all things which I give thee in the commandments unto the children of Israel. So how many of y'all remember this show? <laughs> Don't open the lid. It doesn't work out good for you. <laughs> It doesn't work out too good for you. Why? Because it's the presence of God. You know, it's such a reality about that. I don't know, you know, who did the research on that. But when you think about it, when they opened the lid, they were trying to see God. And God's presence was, was in there. How many of y'all know if we got into God's presence right now in the flesh, we would actually melt? We, we would dissolve. We'd blow the Lord. You know, the special effect thing. Yeah, because we can't stand it. It says nobody can even approach God there. So uh, listen, by the way, there were no images of God allowed to be made. So the cherubs represented the closest thing they could get to God. Now, the Day of Atonement was the day that the high priest would go in with blood. He would take coals from the altar of incense, which was on this side of the curtain, into the holy place. And he would take coals and incense so that when he walked into the Holy of Holies, that incense would smoke it up because he couldn't look on the presence of God. He would die. <laughs> How would you like his job? Yeah, that would thin out the number of senior pastors in the land. It really would. So what he would have to do, he would have to have that incense to go in so it would fog up everything. He would get his way, and it was all really close in. He would go to the mercy seat, which was God's presence, and he would apply blood. And that blood would appease the debt that man had with God temporarily because it was the blood of a lamb or an ox. So once a year, he would have to go in and do that. Well, let me tell you what this is represented of. This is represented of Jesus dying. And the blood that was applied on the mercy seat of God is called propitiation. But this word propitiation means to remove, not the cover, but to remove a debt. How many of y'all know we owed a debt we could not pay? Come on, we could not pay it. 
Jesus came as the final sacrifice, and his blood went and it was placed on the mercy seat, the mercy seat in heaven with God. That blood uh, appeased our debt to God. It removed it because what the blood of goats and lambs could not do, the blood of a spotless lamb. Come on, y'all. Y'all got to get this today. We need to be thanking God for this. The day of atonement is every day because the blood of Christ uh, delivers us and it washes away all our sins. Jesus was that final sacrifice. This cherub, this whole thing that Ezekiel saw was pointing to a day when Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God would come. He would die on a cross. He would bleed his blood. And that blood would be the propitiation for our sins. Let me give you this one last uh, verse today. If I can find it, what did I do with it? Here it goes. Here we go. There's the, the ark. There's the, the cherubs are looking down. Uh, at the uh, lid, and their wings are covering it. In Romans 3.25, looks like one of my uh, iPads is covering everything up here. Let me drop that one. Uh, when uh, Romans 3.25, when God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to dedicate his righteous for the life, uh, remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. It was the blood of Jesus Christ today. These creatures that Ezekiel saw were scary, scarier than anything that we can write. In fact, nobody's ever been able to capture uh, what, anything close to what these things look like. And probably with some special effects, we could do it today. But I want you to understand, this is a stranger thing in the Bible. It's stranger than fiction itself, but it's a reality. It's a real, real deal. We will see when we get to heaven things we've never thought, things that have never entered our hearts or our minds, things that are unbelievable because God is an awesome God. Thank you for joining us today. We pray that you would join us again next week. And uh, we're going to take this to part two. We're going to be looking at some things that are going to be amazing. We're going to be looking at the throne of God over the next couple of weeks. I'm going to tell you who Lucifer really, really was. And uh, so we're going to get to that here in a couple of weeks. Until then, God bless you. Have a great week. 